praise be, Jesus and Mary. I'm David Rodriguez, Content Director of the Fatima Center. Today, I have the great privilege of being joined by both Father Michael Rodriguez and Father James Maudsley. And because we have two priests with us, we certainly want to ask them some of the tough questions. These are questions, I think, that are pressing on many people's minds. Uh, they certainly have been on mine, and there's a lot of discussion. So this very first question, it's a simple question, maybe a complicated answer. And the question, fathers, is who is the Pope? Okay, um, so I'll just I'll just set it up very quickly in that I would say I believe we are in un, we are in an unparalleled crisis. Even though we've had anti popes in the past, we've had three popes at one point in time. You know, the time of Saint Vincent Ferrer. Uh, we certainly know that Benedict has resigned under some strange circumstances. The Vatileaks was all involved in that. He gave an odd speech about splitting the papacy, the two different monuses, you know, and he's sanctifying and the governing, the administrative part. We've read things about how the St. Gallen Mafia hijacked the council. We've heard Francis vow that he's going to remake the church. And we've seen many of the grave scandals that have uh, affected the church and just racked the church. And I think this is even why, certainly, the question is being asked in many different corners. I mean, you have the moral, the financial, the political. Uh, I mean, the scandals we know. We don't need to go into all of those right now, I guess, although they may bear on this question. Uh, just the advancing of the entire globalist agenda. Uh, you know, the green ecumenical religion, a one world religion, if you will. Um, and if that's not bad enough, you have the unending stream of errors and even uh, heresies in a sense of at least material heresies. I will say that they are errors, uh, even violating natural law and the sacredness of, of mass, of holy communion, of allowing you know people who are in a great state of public, uh, great public sin to receive holy communion. So we know a lot of these. And then, of course, the whole uh, pagan worship, uh, idol worship in, in the churches, a, a violation of the first commandment, which is actually more heinous than, than all the others. So we certainly have a lot of problems. And this is getting Catholics really thinking about this. They're very rightly confused, I would say. Um, so I, I would ask you, and I mean, even before I maybe ask you and just turn the floor over to you, I want to make one point, And that's that I do think, and maybe you can even start by commenting on this. I do think it's a legitimate question to ask. I don't, what I don't like personally is that when someone asks this question, it seems there are various different groups out there that immediately sort of want to like shut it down. It's like the cancel culture. They want to censor you. No, no, you can't even ask that question. If you ask that question, let's say maybe you're, you're schismatic already. Uh, this is a wrong question to even ask. We can't even have this conversation, which to me is actually a, a sign of unhealthiness, mm -hmm. right? If you can't even have this in a reasonable and rational discussion, and you just got to shut it down right away, that already is indicative of a very grave problem. Instead, we should say, well, there, there's reasons why these questions are being asked, and perhaps all of our authorities, like our cardinals and our bishops, should be asking these questions as well and inviting dialogue. Since we've heard so much about how we're a church that's inviting dialogue, this might be a very important issue to dialogue about. Uh, so I did want to get out there. You know, I don't think it should be verboten. We should have a reasonable discussion about this. Uh, Father Monzi, maybe your just initial thoughts or comments on this matter? Um, it's always been a simple thing. The Pope is the man, the bishop, who lives in Rome and wears white. So it's very visible, and then there's no doubt, except it's not so clear now with two bishops in Rome wearing white. And it's confusing. It's definitely a legitimate question, an important one to ask, always with um, a humility that we don't have the full truth and facts. Um, and we don't need to assert our opinion so hard that we think others who differ are condemned. But if we just remain silent, even though we have these doubts on our knees, then I think the bishops and cardinals who have shown themselves to be generally um, yes men who keep their head down and want to please the ones above them, they're never going to raise these on their own initiative. Perhaps when enough faithful start bringing them forward to their priests, and the priests will honor that by reporting it to their bishops, whether they agree or not, that there's unease there and doubt, and the bishops will realize that they genuinely have to address this question. So I think by default, I can accept um, most days that Francis is the Pope, but there are, there are sometimes it just seems impossible. He's so anti-Catholic, and I think he's trying to destroy the church. And then I read good arguments why such a man could not possibly be Pope. And when I examine the conclave and the law of the church, which is there in black and white for us all to read, um, I, to be honest, I can't see how that's a valid conclave. 
but it is this thing of shutting us down and telling us you can't even ask that question. You have to leave this to the cardinals. Um, they were there. They're not raising the question. How dare I raise the question? So it's like you're constantly being gaslighted. You can see what you think is reality, um, but you're not allowed to talk about it. Um, so yeah, it's confusing. Well, and I think one thing you mentioned, I don't know if you will sort of second on that, Father Rodriguez, but I, I appreciate how you said we're never going to have a full truth and facts, which mm -hmm. I think is, given the situation that we're in, I mean, our good Lord, uh, he knows the full truth and facts, um, but but no matter who we are, we're not going to. And so often when I read the arguments on either side, whether it's someone who wants to tell me that Benedict is the Pope and they know this for certain, or they want to tell me that it's Francis and they know that for certain, I, I personally will wonder and say, yeah, but you don't have all the truth and all the facts. So how are you so confident in this decision? Who does have the full truth and facts? And if you don't have them, how are we so confident in this when there is this cause for doubt? Is that something that bothers you, Father, or not really? Yes, I would agree. I mean, pretty much echoing a number of the points that you've made, David, and also obviously that Father Moxley has, has made. I do think that it's clear that what's taking place right now in the papacy and the very real questions that are there as to, well, who is the Pope? I mean, in normal times, I think all of us would agree that even just asking that question would be something unheard of. I mean, why would a Catholic even be asking who is the Pope? And yet, just the fact that that question is being raised by many different people. I mean, obviously, priests and theologians and even certainly lay faithful. I think is such a clear sign of the diabolical disorientation that has overwhelmed the church. And again, this is a phrase that Sister Lucia used on multiple occasions, I think particularly in letters that she had written to kind of describe what's taking place right now in the church. And so I do think it is a clear sign of the diabolical disorientation that's in the church. But I think also, like Father Maudsley said, I think it's so important that we remain humble. I mean, I certainly have my own, I think, opinions. I I have extremely serious, serious doubts about whether Pope Francis, uh, Jorge Bergoglio, is, is truly the Catholic Pope, is truly the Pope of the Church. But by the same token, I, um, I do my best to also exercise a certain amount of restraint and definitely humility in, in, in recognizing, well, who am I? You know, I mean, I'm, I'm really nobody. I mean, Yes, I'm a Catholic priest, and there's certainly a great dignity in that. Um, but also, the reason why there's a great dignity in that is not really because of me personally. Obviously, it's because of our Savior, Jesus Christ. It's his priesthood. It's a priesthood of the Catholic Church. But anyway, the point being is that, I mean, I recognize also, I mean, who am I to really know what is taking place right now in the midst of all this confusion and then also recognizing that the diabolical disorientation that has overwhelmed the church i mean i'm certainly not immune to that um i do also kind of want to echo what david had mentioned in that i think even the bigger problem in some ways that we have right now aside from the question of who's the pope Again, certainly a problem, certainly a real question, causing a lot of confusion. I certainly can't tell you that I have a definitive answer. But I think what's also causing great problems is this attitude, and I'd say um, that, as, as it's been mentioned, Father Mazi also said it, that we have different groups and different sides that seem to insist that they know the answer, that with a certainty they know that, well, Pope Francis has to be the Pope, or Pope Francis cannot possibly be the Pope, and so it has to be Pope Benedict, or even others that will claim that neither Francis nor Benedict is the Pope. Um, I, I do think it's very unfortunate that we have, um, again, individuals and groups that um, it, it insist on having this kind of certainty or I find it very difficult to find, you know, how can you have this certainty? You may be, you, you, you may have strong convictions and, you, and, and, and probably your strong convictions are, are based on also, you know, some sound arguments, but there are also some very sound arguments that will, um, 
will will counter that. I I do just kind of in closing before you know the two of you maybe comment. I do in closing uh, just want to say that yes, um, I, I think that the a really important point to make right now that hopefully all of us can agree on is that Francis is very evil. Uh, and oftentimes I'll I'll tell people Francis is evil and evil, 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 that there cannot be any question that he is doing so much to destroy the church. And I think that every good and faithful Catholic because of that has to be extremely careful. I mean, that has to put up um, uh, plenty of opposition to what he's saying and what he's doing, um, particularly when it's very clear that he's going against Catholic Church teaching and when he's um, clearly abusing his authority, as, for example, the case is with the publication of Tradiciones Custodes. I mean, with the publication of Tradiciones Custodes, I mean, it should be clear to those Catholics who know their faith well that the Pope does not have authority to do that. The Pope does not have authority to uh, declare that what has always been the the mass of the Catholic Church is no longer the mass of the Catholic Church. I mean, truly, that is tantamount to saying things like the hell doesn't exist. You know, purgatory doesn't exist. The Blessed Virgin Mary was not immaculately conceived. The Holy Eucharist is not the true presence, body, blood, soul, and divinity of our Savior Jesus Christ. It's just a symbol. Right, Father. And you've just brought me a whole lot of clarity there that our confusion is about who is the Pope, but we're not confused about the realities God wants to reveal to us for our salvation, like about the Holy Eucharist or the Holy Trinity or the Blessed Mother. These things are clear and certain, and Catholics understand we can know reality, true objective reality. And therefore, the certainty of those who say Francis certainly is the Pope or is not the Pope or there hasn't been a Pope since Pius XII, it's not that their certainty that's the problem, but they're insisting that those who disagree are condemned. Right, they're outside the church. Thank they're going to hell. Um, so, the the confusion then over Benedict and Francis or whatever that is not. It, it's important to address that as best one can, but one doesn't need a definitive answer to be to come to heaven, right? But, yeah. Well, and, and that's, I guess, my question because I don't know if you can help me understand sort of the psychology of a person who does get, let's say. Uh, I don't want to use the word pejoratively here, but I'll use it anyway, take it with a grain of salt, who sort of obsesses about this question. Mm -hmm. um, because when I've been faced with that question by various people, and we get that question all the time, I certainly get all the time, I, what I really want to dig down deep, and I sort of try to ask, well, why does this concern you so much? Like, what are you going to do about it? Like, how, mm -hmm. what's going to change in your life? Things that you actually can control. How is your life going to be different if today you knew the answer definitively was, you know, Francis or definitively knew it was Benedict? How, how is this really affecting you? What's right. So what's going on in a person's psychology? Why they sort of, for those who do sort of obsess about it to the point that they're willing to condemn others who don't agree with them. Um, I'm trying to understand why this is such a, a deep issue. Um you know, if we had something else, like uh, it, it certainly there are certain things that uh, we know are wrong, receiving mortal sin, uh, receiving Holy Communion state of mortal sin. I mean, that concerns us greatly for the sacrilege that's committed against our Lord, for the destruction that's bringing in the world, the great evil. Um, are they putting it at that level? Is it? I mean, I, I'm, I try to, I'm trying to get that psychology. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I don't I don't know that I can answer why we're kind of like, let's say, wired that way. But I do agree that I think it is very common. Um, and I think it's unfortunate. I think also it's unfortunate that I think there's a tendency on the part of certain, let's say, even traditional groups that they make a bigger issue out of the question of the Holy Father, uh, who is the Pope, than just those realities that we know God has revealed, what you were referring to, Father Maudsley. And what I mean by that is that they almost make it seem as if the other traditional groups that don't agree with them on who is the Pope, is it Francis, is it Benedict, that almost as if they're bigger enemies to the faith than all those, let's say the mainstream Novus Ordo, that doesn't believe, for example, in the Holy Eucharist, or that don't really believe in how holy and sacred the mass is and believe that you know you can just make radical changes to the mass and that that's okay just because the pope said that or just because the bishops say that again i'm 
namely referring to the new mass and the changes that were made in the aftermath of the Second Vatican Council, that w these groups then tend to make the issue of the Pope into a, an issue that's even bigger than dogmas that have been revealed by God and that are defined by the Catholic Church, which I think that's the area where we have very serious problems in the mainstream church. And I do think that as, I, I do think traditional Catholics definitely have to make more of an effort of working to create a, a, a greater unity amongst ourselves in spite of maybe legitimate differences on the question of who the Pope is, however difficult that may be, psychologically or for whatever other reasons. But I do think it's really important to I mean, consider consider this because I I think again it's like a, kind of like that yeah, I mean, diabolical disorientation. How can I be more it, kind of obsessed with the question right. of, of but but Francis maybe that can Kennedy. answer that. And so, I'm not playing devil's advocate here, and then you sort of shoot me down, please. I hope you shoot me down. Um, so what I would say is, okay, I get what you're saying, Father. And so if I'm really concerned about this and I'm obsessing about this, then it stands to reason that it's because I think it's an issue of salvation. So I would say, well, I know that to be a faithful Catholic, and including to accept the doctrines that you have sort of mentioned, mm -hmm. I also have to be in union with the Pope. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's been taught infallibly, you know, 1308 in the bull uh, by Boniface, um, when I'm sanctum. So if I'm not in union with the Pope, then my soul is in danger of being lost. And because I have a solicitude for other souls, I want you all to be saved also. So we all have to be in union with the Pope. But if we're in union with the wrong guy, then we're all going to hell. So I don't want to go to hell. So this is this is so, why it is so important and why I'm going to get so... What I think is correct there is that it is a matter of salvation that be it be addressed at the right time by the right people. So, but if we know our place to say, well, we can see reality, we can see there's a problem, we would discuss this problem with people around us or who we respect, and but then leave the matter, you know, and, and hope that those um, at the top of the hierarchy will address it. And for them, it probably is a matter of salvation. If they have their suspicions, um, and they're not speaking out and they're not doing anything about it, the cardinals, I mean, or if they're just refusing to examine the question, then for them, it perhaps is a matter of salvation, but not, I think, for the flock who don't have the data or responsibility more than just to discuss. And I think what Father Rodriguez said at the beginning, though, is what's clearer and more urgent is to resist Francis because of the evil he's doing. That is clear. Whether he's the Pope or not the Pope, he needs to be resisted. And then the question of who is the Pope is very interesting and important, but that's the priority. I, I, I appreciate the point you make, David, because I think it is a very good point. Because there's no question that it is something very serious. And I also agree with you that I think there are a lot of the faithful that are, let's say, gravely concerned, not maybe use the word obsessed, uh, uh, um, over the issue. But... I mean, my response is that although it's true that it's essential for our salvation, it's necessary for our salvation to be in union with the Pope, I mean, that is assuming that we know who the Pope is. I mean, the point being is that I have to have every intention and desire and I have to make every effort to be in union with the Pope. You know, I can't, like, let's right. say, for example, claim I don't believe in the Pope. The Pope doesn't have authority over right. me. And what's happening is that those other aspects, I mean, are in question right now. I mean, again, I think that, it, I, I mean, in my own conscience, I mean, and I'm doing my best to be sincere. I love the papacy. I, I certainly have no intention of not being in union with the Pope. Um, I'm, I'm doing the best I can. I could probably do better some, but but let's say I'm 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 working hard. Let's say I'm striving to try to be in union with the Pope. But I also recognize that I'm not sure what's what's taking place here. And so I don't I mean I don't really see how God can judge that soul and say, well, like for example, that's he's in not in union with the Pope because he is in error, let's say, over who the real Pope is. Let's say I think Pope Benedict is the real Pope, and in actual fact, in God's eyes, it's Pope Francis. I I, I simply don't see how God could hold, like let's say, me to a harsh judgment 
because I'm making that error, a sincere error, when, as I think Father Maudsley just mentioned, when those in authority, when those who have the responsibility and the grace from God to make that determination and, right. and have that responsibility to do it, are not doing it. Yeah. I mean, what are you going to do? I mean, um, right, but what if they come back and they tell you, but they have made that decision. And and they're all sort of, uh, as far as I can tell, let's say unanimously behind it being Francis, because well, nothing's raising their voice. Answer questions, good questions, for example, about the conclave. Well, we see the law of the church that there shouldn't be this lobbying, choosing a candidate beforehand, and then lobbying to get him in, which we've been told on camera um, by McCarrick, I think, by Cor Michael Murphy O'Connor, and maybe Daniel's put it in his book. Yeah, Daniel's put so it in his book. This is out there that they've done this. And can they explain to us, please, how that isn't a contradiction of the law, which said that invalidates the conflict completely? So then there's questions that they're not answering, which yeah. then is what's arousing. So they all can't those just doubts. simply dealt with it. Let them answer the question. They actually have to do that. You can't you exactly yeah. see what you're and saying. Okay. Patrick Coffin is uh, raising excellent questions for there being an impeded sea and Benedict being the Pope. And when he makes such solid arguments, um, which when I hear them, he kind of convinces me, you know. But then you go away and it's hard to think, is Francis really not the Pope? But those kind of questions, instead of being dismissed by the hierarchy, they should answer them. If we can just go back a bit to why people might be so concerned about this, I think there's an overestimation of how much you're expected to do to the Pope under obedience. There's actually, for lay people, very little that it makes a difference who the Pope is in terms of obedience. So Amoris Laetitia, for example, there's nothing in that document, nothing that requires your obedience. It, it can be completely ignored. Like nearly everything Francis says or, or writes, um, it gives a loophole for people who want to deceive themselves into continuing in mortal sin. But that's nothing to do with obedience. And then with Tradition of Custodes, as you say, that whole document is to be fully ignored and not to be treated like law. Um, no one has the authority, no one, to go against God and Christ and the tradition of the church as that document does. So that doesn't bind on obedience either. And then perhaps people could be a bit more, um, say, okay, even if I don't know who the Pope is, that's not the end of the world to my spiritual life. Um, but please, God, those who are in the position to do this will look into it, answer the questions, and give us an answer. I think, uh, I mean, is it fair to say then that I, I mean, I certainly think this is a cross that we're having to suffer under, and by we, I mean the collective church right now at this time. Mm -hmm. um, and that as long as we don't intentionally put ourselves in schism saying, well, I know he's the Pope and I won't, I won't be in union with him because, you know, like in times past when someone would go into schism like Henry VIII, um, there was no question there who the Pope was. Uh, but if we're trying, that's what you were saying, doing our best, um, and then we continue working on our spiritual life, and then we pray that those who need to be answering these questions actually address these questions and that God will kind of get us out of this morass soon. Um, I guess that's all we do. The last thing I'll just say. Maybe it's because we've not had a Pope doing what a Pope should do for some time. Right. And so, as Our Lady said, given the vision of Fatima, right? The bishop in white, as if in the mirror. I was about to go there. You read yeah. my mind there, Father. Well, no, well, but I agree. I think it's it. part this of the chastisement. Absolutely. Yeah. I think it's part, again, I mean, our Blessed Mother said, Fatima, that the Holy Father is mm -hmm. going to suffer much, basically also warning that the church was going to suffer much. I mean, we brought it upon ourselves, and I definitely would agree that what is taking place today is also the result of the sins of the hierarchy and the sins of past popes. I mean, and even if you just name them all saints, all of them saints, and John the Twenty Third. If you're going to name them all saints, then God said, "Okay, if that's your version of a saint, I'll give you what you're asking for." You know what? Sometimes God gives you what you asked for, and you find out that was not a good thing to ask. And we've been treating the pope like not a pope and the pope yeah. has been treating the church like his toy changing the mass in in the 60s right um so god's letting it run to a conclusion and, and so well i'm glad you bring up fatima father because again i would say that fatima unlike any other vision i've always said this the pope is a central figure in fatima and, and we should all recognize that that, that the pope has a, a, an obligation that he has to do he has to obey god he has to command the bishops he mm -hmm. has to consecrate russia uh, it's all about his authority um which he's rescinded for for many decades now the popes mm -hmm. have uh, the Pope is the one that has much to suffer. We have the vision where he's being martyred. I mean, no other vision is sort of focused so much on the Pope. So the fact that we have this great crisis in the papacy, and we're so unsure, and, and we don't know who it is. I mean, I, it was a quip, but someone just told me when I was talking about it, they said, you know what, I don't think either Bregoglio or Ratzinger themselves know who the Pope is, because they've thrown so much confusion into the pot. 
Um, so it is very confusing, but I think that's that's why we have turned to the message of Our Lady Fatima, right? Yeah. And that's the only solution that we heed her call. And I think until we obey Our Lady of Fatima and we're all praying our rosary, praying right. for the consecration, getting our brown scapular on, offering prayers first and penances, Saturday. doing the first Saturday, until we're all doing this, um, the bishops and priests included, uh, we're not going to get clarity for this. But it's only, I think, Our Lady who's going to bring that clarity. You're right. And Our Lady can give us peace over this whole question when you hear about the one who seemed uh, uh, as a pope or the bishop in white, you know, and you, and the reflection in the mirror. So, you know, yes, there's a time of confusion. Heaven has seen it already. Heaven has it covered. And um, it's a terrible suffering for the church. But Our Lady has everything in hand. And so if, if we will do, and especially the pope do what she asks, because there will be disobedience since 1960 to her. Well, since 1929, when she asked for the consecration. Since okay. 1960, for not revealing the third secret. Right. Okay. So well, I would just say in closing, say in response to the faithful who, you know, claim that, well, you know, we have to know who the Pope is or we know who the Pope is and we have to be in union with the Pope and we have to, you know, accept the authority of the Pope in order to be saved. I would just I would just remind them, look, there's always the hierarchy of truths um, and just go to the Athanasian Creed at the very beginning of the Athanasian Creed. I mean, it says very clearly what the Catholic Church teaches that. What is most essential for our salvation? I mean, it doesn't, the Athanasian Creed does not say that in order to be saved, you know, you absolutely have to know who the Pope is and you absolutely have to be, you know, under, I mean, obeying, you know, everything that the Pope says and does. What the Athanasian Creed says very clearly is that what is essential for salvation is you have to hold, you know, without blemish, you know, pure, uh, integrally, the, the Catholic faith, the one true Catholic faith. And he would could say just namely doctrine and and worship the Lex Orandi and the Lex Redi of the Catholic Church. Um, that uh, has precedence. We have to hold on to that and um, trust in God and our Blessed Mother to sort out this chaos for us, to have mercy on us and sort out the chaos. So there's certainly a lot of confusion about this point, but I think I just like to get back to uh, certainly for me as a father, as a layman. You know, what does this mean for me? I think that's a very pressing question we all have to ask ourselves because all too often what I see the problem is is that we spend way too much time on this, maybe reading the internet, uh, you know, arguing with people uh, and very possibly even abandoning our duties or neglecting our duties, whether it be our prayer, our meditation. As parents, maybe we neglect our children. Your job, I mean, you can neglect a lot of things because you get so into this and, and even bring in a lack of charity. So I, I see that as also a, a big pitfall in this whole issue. Uh, your thoughts? Yeah, so if we're tempted into simply resenting or hating Francis instead of praying for him or neglecting our duties of state, uh, dealing with questions above our head, then we're in trouble. Right, because your point was that the bishops, let's say, or the cardinals have to do their duty asking mm -hmm. these questions. But if I'm not doing my duty, which is, let's say, being a dad and a husband, then, then I'm also failing. And although I think it is our duty to make some noise about it so the bishops notice, they're not mind readers. And... The more measured it can be, normally the better. Um, write a short letter to them, speak to them respectfully when one encounters them. But in the real world, in such pain and chaos, you know, they both scream. And the bishops need to be attentive. They're always saying they're listening to us. Why aren't they hearing this pain? Well, listen to some of the set of accountists. Uh, they've got such good research of church history. They know church documents better than anyone else. Their arguments are fairly logical. Whether or not you're giving the conclusion or not, They've got a lot of good points to make, and they're being completely ignored instead of taken into account. Amen. Um, amen, Father. I would just come in and say, I think, as I mentioned earlier, it's just another example of the diabolical disorientation that's taking place in the church. That You have faithful Catholics, I think Catholics that maybe are trying to really, you know, um, do God's will, um, be pious. Uh, be faithful to the Pope, but again, obsessing excessively over this issue of the, the, the papacy and who's the Pope, that they're neglecting things that are directly under their control. As we said, the duties, the duties of their state in life. I mean, um, that's something that they can control. Did you pray the rosary? I mean, are you wearing your brown scapular? Are you doing the devotion for the first five Saturdays? Are you making efforts to be a better father, a better mother? Are you trying to make a better confession? You know, you're working harder to um, grow in virtue and um, uh, overcome vice. 
And if you're too distracted from all of those things because you're concerned about who the Pope is, well, you're not going to be able to do anything directly to resolve the, the conflict that's taking place right now uh, in the Sea of Peter. But um, there's certainly a lot you can do to take care of uh, resolving the conflicts that are in your own marriage and in your own home and in your own family. And so if the devil can misdirect your energies and misdirect your attention and your focus, well, here again, the, di the diabolical disorientation that's taking place in, in, in the church. We're more concerned about things that are beyond our control and less concerned about the things that are in, are in our control. Well, perhaps we haven't resolved this question. It'll continue, but at least hopefully we've given some people the ability to have some peace and to not have so much uh, conflict and to turn to Our Lady of Fatima. So thank you, dear viewer. Thank you, fathers, for joining us. And may God bless you. If in your heart you can consider also sending a donation to the Fatima Center, that would be most appreciated. And we'll see you for our next special interview. Mm -hmm.